r slash no sleep posted by you slash horror junkie 123 i got a job at long john silvers i regret ever applying here final every second felt as if it lasted an eternity lloyd and Ahmad were still nowhere to be seen and the only noise that drifted to our ears was the sound of the trees rustling though normally i'd be scared shitless by that it provided me with a small sliver of solace because it likely meant that my co-workers were still alive come on boys you can do it greg murmured staring tensely at the tree line i was starting to doubt whether my intuition was correct were those two going to make it but then we saw a silhouette someone or something was bolting toward us i released a breath i hadn't known i'd been holding it was ahmad his face was red as a fire engine and he was covered in nicks and cuts from the thick undergrowth but he was alive and to my immense relief i noted that lloyd wasn't far behind then my stomach twisted itself into knots because neither was oculus the ground shook as the trio continued their med dash they were closing the distance lloyd and ahmad to safety and oculus to them come on boys faster run like your lives depend on it greg shouted amidst all the commotion seriously greg was that supposed to be a joke their lives do depend on it not the time man i set aside my irritation with greg and directed my focus back to the scene unfolding before me whoosh ahmad burst into the hallway skidding to a halt against the wall and collapsing onto the ground lloyd was the only one left i could see the desperation in his eyes he was inches away one more final push and maybe just maybe he'd my eyes grew wide as saucers and my jaw fell to the floor in complete shock Lloyd had made it to the doorway. But so did Oculus. A sharp pitch black claw protruded from Lloyd's chest, spraying crimson across Greg's raincoat. A wet gurgling sound emitted from his throat as dark, red blood bubbled from his mouth. Before any of us could react, the appendage retracted, with Lloyd still attached. I watched as Oculus clamped down on his skull with those salivating pincers, delivering a deadly dose of venom, and caving his head in all with a single strike. Oculus glared at us. Each of its eyes glimmered with satisfaction. It was taunting us, rubbing salt in our wounds. And then, out of the blue, it scampered away with Lloyd's lifeless corpse clenched in its jaws. We stood there, unmoving, unblinking, just completely motionless. None of us could even begin to process what we'd witnessed. I glanced over to Ahmad. He hugged his knees as tears began welling at the corners of his eyes. Greg stared solemnly at his boots. He was standing so still that I thought he might have blacked out. Until he pressed the button to close the door. No. What are you doing? We have to go back in there and get him. He could still be alive, Ahmad shouted, charging toward Greg. The faux sailor turned to Ahmad, clasping his broad shoulders in a vice grip. Ahmad, look at me. He instead averted his gaze. I said look at me, damn it. Ahmad reluctantly obeyed, locking eyes with our boss. Lloyd is dead. I know that. You know that. We all know that. A single bite from Oculus is venomous enough to take down 200 men, let alone one. He's not coming back. Ahmad's bottom lip began to quiver as he spoke. So, what then? We're just gonna fucking leave him in there? We could at least give him a proper burial. Don't you think he deserves that? Greg pursed his lips. You know we can't do that, Ahmad. Not right now. Either our system is faulty, or Oculus is building an immunity to the sleeping gas. Whatever the case, we can't risk retrieving the body right now. Not when there's a chance that we could lose another man. Ahmad couldn't contain his emotions any longer. Tears began to flow freely down his cheeks, and he released a guttural, lamented shriek. Greg softly pulled him closer, and Ahmad buried his face into Greg's blood-spattered raincoat. They stayed like that for a long time. Greg, a beacon of comfort, and Ahmad, a devastated wreck over the loss of his colleague. I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a few terrors myself. I'd only been acquainted with Lloyd for a day, but I knew that he didn't deserve to die. Not like that. Three years. Three painstaking years I spent training that boy, Ahmad muttered, breaking the tense silence that permeated the air between us all. I worked every damn day to teach him how to handle these things. How to survive. And this was the result. I've failed him. I opened my mouth to speak. I knew that I was just a rookie with zero experience with that sort of thing, but still. It felt like I needed to say something. I racked my brain for anything I could think of to comfort Ahmad in that moment. But the words wouldn't come out. You're not a failure. I am. Lloyd's death is not on you, Ahmad. Do you hear me? 
Greg said, staring intensely with his good eye. Yes. Greg sternly nodded. After another moment, he turned toward me. Mason, Ahmad. I'm giving everyone three days off to grieve. I'll handle your keeper duties during that time. Thank you, Mr. Calloway, Ahmad replied. His voice sounded flat. Defeated. Yeah, I appreciate it, Mr. Greg, I chimed in. Yeah. Don't mention it. The walk back to the control room was marred by a tense silence. I didn't stick around to see Greg deliver the news to the girls. Instead, I walked with Ahmad back to the surface, up the staircase from hell, and into the dingy lobby of Long John Silver's. I don't know if it helped, but I thought Ahmad could use some company. Once we exited the restaurant, I faced him. I'm, um, really sorry about what happened today. I know I'm not much help, but if there's anything I can do for you, don't hesitate to ask, okay? He nodded, producing a pack of Marlboro Reds and a lighter from his pocket. Yeah. Thanks, he said, lighting a cigarette. Without knowing what else to say, I began to shuffle off. Suddenly, Ahmad grabbed my arm preventing me from leaving. You utter a word about any of that, and I will personally slit your throat, got it? I gulped and nodded. I was no slouch, but I highly doubted that I could take Ahmad in a scuffle if it came down to it. And that definitely was not the time. Good. Now, get out of here, he retorted, taking a long, drawn-out inhale of smoke before blowing it into the air. He didn't have to tell me twice. I booked it home. After everything I'd seen, I was all too eager to plop down in bed share a nice home-cooked meal with my folks, and pop the top on an ice-cold beer. Maybe even liquor. Whatever I could get my hands on to help me forget. I think it goes without saying that I had some real trouble falling asleep that night. I just couldn't get that image out of my head. Lloyd's body skewered on the end of Oculus's leg. Those giant fangs encompassing his skull and crushing it like a grape. The blood gushing from his mouth like a geyser. I'd seen some fucked up shit in prison, sure, but nothing even close to that. Of course, that got me thinking. I was stupid for not realizing it sooner. The insanely good salary, most of it was hazard pay. I had unknowingly signed up for one of the most dangerous jobs in the world, and I needed to find a way out. Come on, Mason, think. How can you quit this place without being hunted down by the government? A light bulb flickered in my head. I could get the place shut down. Maybe if I left an anonymous tip over something they couldn't trace me back to, like a payphone then the whole operation would be shut down, and I'd come out of the whole ordeal unscathed. I knew it was a harebrained scheme, but I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. My life was at stake. It took some digging, but after visiting a couple different sites and online forums, I was able to locate the closest pay phone. As luck would have it, it was only a 10 minute walk from my parents' house. How convenient. As I pulled on my coat and made up some half-assed excuse about needing something from the store to appease my mother, a thought crossed my mind. One I should have taken more seriously. Is this a bad idea? Yeah, no shit it was a bad idea. But you know what they say. Hindsight is always 2020. I didn't even remember the walk to the payphone. I was so lost in thought that it felt as if I'd been teleported to it. My heart thundered in my chest as I inserted my change and reached for the phone. It felt like I was doing something wrong. Like I was a rotten kid about to make a prank call. But, in my mind, I had to do it. I hesitantly dialed the numbers 911. Hello? Please. What is your name and the nature of your emergency? Hi, uh, I'd like to place an anonymous tip. Sir, I need a name and a phone number from you. Fine. My name is, um, Jason, and I'm calling from a pay phone. And what is your emergency, Jason? The lady on the other end of the line already sounded perturbed. Great. I was confident that she was going to take me seriously. So, I'd like to report a fraudulent establishment. Long John Silver's. It's not really a restaurant. It's a drug front. I silently pumped my fist, and patted myself on the back for thinking on the fly. If I had told her that there was an underground cryptid research facility down there, she'd write me off instantly. But a drug front? Now, that was believable. Sir, please do not call this number again. Unless you have an actual emergency. Prank calls are violations of the law and you will be charged with placing a false police report on your next offense. Is that clear? Wait. This isn't a joke, I'm. The line went dead. She'd really dismissed everything I'd told her without a second thought. I grumbled under my breath as I slunk away. I was going to need a new plan, and fast. The last thing I wanted was to end up like Lloyd. I was deep in thought, 
brainstorming my next move, when a jet black SUV screeched to a halt on the street beside me. Two burly men wearing ski masks slept from the vehicle and raced over to me. My heart dropped into my toes. You've really done it now, Mason. You're fucked with a capital F. H hey, fellas. No need to take any drastic measures, I said, awkwardly raising my hands in the air to show that I wasn't a threat. We can talk this out, okay? I. Wham. One of the masked men sucker punched me in the face. A rag was violently shoved over my mouth and nose. I couldn't breathe. The vile stench of whatever noxious chemicals soaked into the fabric was all I could manage to suck in. Before I even had time to process what had just hit me, it was lights out. I lazily opened my eyes. For a moment, I'd completely forgotten about the events that led up to my untimely nap. Ah! What the fuck, I shouted, a pang of fear coursing through my body like a lightning bolt. Greg's face was mere inches from mine. Oh, good. You're alive. Thought we might have killed you for a minute there, he admitted, backing away from me. Upon surveying my surroundings, I noticed that we were in a large room with concrete walls and what appeared to be empty enclosures to either side of me. I glanced down and realized that my arms and legs had been bound to a chair with rope. I also noted that we weren't alone. The men whom I assumed had kidnapped me stood behind Greg, their arms folded across their chests. I'm sure you know why you're here, Greg said, frowning and staring expectantly at me with his only good eye. Ah, uh, my memory's kinda fuzzy. Can you give me a quick refresher? He sighed. Mason, you tried to call the cops and report this place. Jason? Seriously? You've gotta try a little harder than that, son. My brows furrowed in confusion. How did they know? Before you ask, Greg continued, the local precinct is on our payroll. Say hello to Officer Garrick and Officer Jenkins. They're off duty, but they just so happened to be in the area when you decided to carry out your flawless plan. He then turned to the pair, who all the while had remained still as statues. We're good, boys. Thanks for your help. I can take it from here. They didn't say a word. Each simply nodded before taking their leave. I heard the door slam shut behind them, sealing my fate. It was just me and Greg. Look, kid. I'll cut you a little bit of slack this time and this time only. I think what you did was a knee-jerk reaction to Lloyd's passing, and that is the sole reason I'm going so easy on you. Just so we're clear, once you accepted that job offer, you signed your life away. The government owns you now. It owns all of us. We're puppets in their game, and you and I both know how quickly they'll toss us to the wayside the moment we step out of line. You're lucky that the bigwigs haven't caught wind of this. No more major fuck-ups. Got it? Greg spat. A dizzying concoction of emotions swirled within me once he said that. On one hand, I was immensely relieved. Greg was taking it easy on me, and my idiotic antics hadn't cost me my life. On the other hand, I felt deep despair. My suspicions had been correct. I couldn't leave Long John Silver's until I was no longer useful to them, or until I ended up in a body bag. Yeah. I swear on my life that it won't happen again. Thanks for letting me off the hook. I really appreciate it, I muttered, sheepishly meeting Greg's fiery gaze. Oh, no, Mason. I didn't say I was letting you off the hook. You need to learn. If I don't administer some kind of punishment, then what would deter you from trying again? I can't have that. I hope you can understand, he said, trudging to the back of my chair and dragging me toward the exhibit to my right. My face drained of color and blood began to pound in my ears. A sudden realization smacked me like a ton of bricks. There was a reason I hadn't recognized the room we were in. This was the basement. I didn't know what kind of creatures they housed in that area, but I had a feeling that they were somehow much worse than anything I'd been exposed to thus far. Please Mr. Greg, you don't have to do this. I've learned my lesson, I promise. I begged as he placed me squarely in front of the glass. I didn't want it to come to this, Mason. I really didn't. But you have to understand that there are real consequences for going behind my back. Greg wrapped his knuckles twice against the glass. To my abject horror, something began to emerge from the shadows. Before I knew it, I was staring into the face of a teenage boy. He was wearing all black clothing with painted nails and eyeshadow. His face was pale as a ghost, his bone white skin nearly reflective in the dimly lit room. He wore a depraved grin on his face, like he was about to have his first meal in ages, and I was next on the menu. Mason, I want you to meet Hayashma, the Demon of Wrath. He's currently confined to this boy's body, but nevertheless, he still wields an immeasurable amount of power. Ayashma, do not kill him or cause him to lose his sanity. We just lost a keeper, 
So we need everyone we can get right now. Well, I think that about covers it. You two have fun, Greg smirked, his rubber boots squeaking loudly as he walked away. Nice to meet you, Mason. I have a feeling that we're going to get along just fine, Ayashma bellowed, his manic grin somehow stretching even wider. And then it started. My vision grew blurry, and the world around me began to spin violently. I squeezed my eyes shut, praying that the vertigo would relent. Hot bile snaked up my throat, and I couldn't stop myself from spewing chunks. The distinct taste of half-digested clam chowder assaulted my tongue. Disgusting. Once I opened my eyes, I didn't find myself covered in puke with my new friend staring into my psyche. No, where I'd ended up, I wished I was back in that dingy room. Because over the next couple of hours, I would experience the worst pain I'd ever felt in my entire life. There was nothing but fire and scorched earth for as far as the eye could see, an endless void of destruction. That thing. It tormented me for what felt like days. Just about every torture method you can think of, it implemented, but with a much more violent twist. I was waterboarded with molten lava. My eyeballs were plucked out, and my eyelids were painstakingly sewn shut. My skin was peeled off like a potato. I screamed and screamed, but there was nothing I could do. All the while, that monstrosity loomed over me, laughing. Like my agony was the funniest thing it had ever witnessed. And it showed no signs of letting up. I don't know how long I was forced to endure that. It felt like days, but in reality, it couldn't have lasted longer than a few hours. I'm sure you can imagine my elation when I awoke to find that I was physically unscathed. Mentally, that was another story. It took months before I was okay again. Greg's scare tactic did the trick. Since then, I've followed my orders to a T. It's been a little over a year since this occurred. I'm finally finding the courage to make this post after all that time. Why, though? Why now? Well, I'm living on borrowed time. I've been diagnosed with stage 4 pancreatic cancer. The doctors say it's aggressive, and that I don't have much time left. I'm taking precautions, of course, but if the government does happen to discover this post, I don't care. I'm going to die soon anyway, but before I do, I need to get this out there. This story is a warning. If you're ever offered a job at Long John Silver's that seems way too good to be true, please, please turn it down. No amount of money is worth forfeiting your life. Thank <laughs> you.